in the premiere of House of the Dragon, you may have noticed that rats come up in the episode a lot. Queen Helena says she is afraid of the rats to the befuddlement of her husband and maids. The murderous cheese with his dubious rat catching effectiveness is shown catching a few and lugging around the traps along with a few rat corpses for good measure. Blood, the official gold cloak daemon stan, also lugs around a few rat traps briefly before abandoning him to his murderous son for a son bounty. And of course, there's actual rats all over the castle, particularly in the hidden passages as blood and cheese make their infamous ascent into the royal apartments. It's a regular rat bonanza. You cannot escape rats in this episode. However, there are some secret rats as well you may have missed during your viewing. And if you're a viewer of this channel and a Larish Strong aficionado, you may know where this is going. The Rat King is back. Last season, I wrote a well-known theory about how Laris is a skin changer and green seer using his magical powers to spy on and gain power at court. And critically, or I guess maybe how the theory has become known, is that I suggested that Laris uses the rats to spy for him, like how Bran uses ravens, wolves, and sometimes Hodor in Game of Thrones. Sharp-eyed viewers have noticed that there are rats in many unusual places throughout season one, and a lot of subtle hints linking Laris Strong to the Weirwoods and the magical parts of this universe. And Laris knows things that he seemingly shouldn't or couldn't know. He's basically doing his best Blood Raven impression. Ever since watching this first episode, I've been wondering what the role of the spy master Laris Strong is with the murder of Prince Jaehaerys. And no, not just because I think about Laris way, way too much. <laughs> no, 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 not that. Don't be silly. There are some oddities in the sequence of events that have given me pause. And before we get into the rat nest, yes, this is a bit of a tinfoil theory and very well could be proved wrong and the mad ravings of a guy on the internet with a microphone. With that out of the way, let's start at the beginning in Queen Helena. Helena has been established as a dragon dreamer, having the ability to see the future and, and seemingly has seen the daggers in the dark that have been coming for her children. She becomes concerned, then scared, as Aegon is looking for Prince Jaehaerys and wants to bring the boy to the small council. This really shouldn't be a big deal for Helena. Jaehaerys normally goes to a library for his prince lessons, however he's fairly young and it's not like he has exams the next day. A disruption of one day's lessons isn't the end of the world. So why is this bugging Helena? The context here is that House of the Dragon has been showing us that Aegon is a largely absent father, prince, and now king. When he walks into Helena's chambers, he thinks Jahera is her twin Jaehaerys, and when he realizes he's got the wrong kid, he then asks where his son is. Helena responds that Jaehaerys is in the library, and Aegon must not interrupt his custom. What this is telling us is that Aegon isn't super involved in his kids' lives and doesn't know that Jaehaerys has a daily quote-unquote custom, as Helena calls it, and is already receiving an education. Like with many other parts of his life, Aegon has been absent as a father figure, leaving the children to be raised by Helena, which is true for his character broadly. Aegon has ignored every aspect of duty in his life as a prince, except for the thrills and impulses it allowed him to indulge. As a prime example, before he was made Aegon II, the prince was willing to abandon his family to run to Essos to avoid becoming king, pleading with his brother Aemon to let him disappear. And for previous episodes, we also know that he has left at least one bastard, maybe more in King's Landing. In fairness, it seems like in the scene that Aegon is trying to turn over a new leaf, that becoming king has inspired him to try and become a better part of his children's life, which is admirable. However, based on Helena's reaction, this might be the first time he has ever asked to spend time with his son in quite a long time, and that's the important part of this interaction other than righteously dunking on Aegon. Prophetic dreams like Helena's often have small details that reveal they are coming true. In her premonitions, Helena may have dreamed that on the day Jaehaerys is taken to his council is the day the Rat King comes for the boy. Maybe she kept Jaehaerys on a rigid daily schedule to try and protect her son from the nightmare she could not escape by making sure he never goes to the small council that she always knows where he is. It's incredibly common in universe for prophets to try and avoid the things they see, making for very strange behaviors to those around them. As Aegon says, the queen is an enduring mystery and... This is probably why she's reacting to things that no one else understands, but makes perfect sense to her alone. It's notable that after Aegon asks for Jaehaerys, we see the gears start turning in Helena's mind. Afterwards, she says unprompted that she is afraid. And when Aegon tries to guess what she's talking about and thinks that she's talking about a dragon attack, she corrects him and says, no, she means the rats. Spoiler, there's no rats in the room. Her eyes then lock on the beds of Jaehaerys and Jaehaera, showing that she has started to recognize the sequence of events she fears are unfolding, and she's trying desperately to communicate it. 
And as to being afraid of the rats, a straightforward explanation here is that because blood and cheese show up as rat catchers in the language of dream, perhaps she sees them as rats. Fairly normal stuff. It's typical in dragon dreams. Targaryens become dragons. Starks become wolves. Baratheons become stags. A rat catcher becoming a rat fits in with the pattern. Cool. However, let's take a walk on the wild side of tinfoil that the rat she's afraid of aren't just blood and cheese, but someone manipulating the Red Keep for his own purposes. My suspicion that Laris may be involved and perhaps being one of the rats that Helena fears comes from two simple questions. First, what happened to the maid that ran from blood? And second, why was the castle deserted? Let's take these one at a time. We're told earlier in the episode by Laris that he has personally cleared or quote unquote replaced the entirety of the castle staff with workers who are now loyal to him. And as a warning, he killed the ones that he found disloyal or not useful, which by the way, means he cleared cheese who was given up by Mysaria as a castle rat catcher with huge gambling debts and no morals. Literally the guy Damon should seek out to try and assassinate the member of the royal family. It's very odd that Laris looked at this cheese guy and said, you know what, he can stay. Laris very helpfully tells this all to Allison as a brag and a warning that everyone around her is now under control, but he's also telling us the audience. He doesn't even need magic powers at this point to spy on everybody. Everyone in the Red Keep is feeding him information and now terrified of crossing the clubfoot. To get back to my question, during the attack, blood runs into the maid we saw earlier in Helena's chambers, one of the maids that Laris said is now his. When the maid suspects something is amiss with this odd, burly rat catcher that she's never seen before, she very quickly exits the room and then disappears into nothingness. She straight up vanishes like this is Harry Potter. Blood chases her and she is faded out of this reality before he can even get to the door. You would think a maid who suspects there's intruders in the unguarded royal apartments would do something with that information. Really anything. Raise the alarm, start screaming, find guardsmen or the king's guard, other servants nearby, a maester, really find anyone at all. And yet, during the murder and Helena's flight from her quarters to her mother's, there is not a person in sight, no shouts of alarm, nothing. The castle is quiet as a graveyard, except for the sound of knife on bone. And we know that the route Helena took with Jahara is a long one. It's the exact same route Rhaenyra took with her newborn Joffrey from her apartments to the former Queen Allison's chambers. Plenty of time for a maid to find someone and ask for help of any kind. And yet that didn't happen. And you have to wonder why. And also wonder if her employer, Lara Strong, had something to do with it. And that leads me into my next question. Why is everyone else missing from the royal apartments, staircases, and common areas? Earlier in the episode, we previously saw that Otto, Aemon, and Kristen were all meeting and hatching schemes of war in this area. And also that Aegon and his Aegoons were hanging out in the throne room getting drunk and cracking wise. Right around the time Blood and Cheese make their move, coincidentally, this entire area becomes deserted, except for our one vanishing maid. We at least have one answer for where somebody should be, and that's Lord Commander Kristen Cole. He was in bed with Dowager Queen Allison having Rhaenyra hate sex. Kristen's whereabouts could not be under Laris's control, however, it could definitely be in his knowledge as he demonstrated earlier. And we also see that at least some of the guards of the castle are standing in the throne room. Kristen himself not being on duty is a problem, and likely will be in the next episode as everyone tries to throw blame at each other for who's most responsible for the death of Jaehaerys. Kristen isn't the only possible person that could have been anywhere near Helena's room. There's more members of the Kingsguard. There's men at arms, knights, maids, stewards, random castle staff all throughout the evening and night. And yet the way is totally and eerily clear for blood and cheese to bungle their way into murder. And critically, it's not just for them to get there as they cross through the throne room and into secret passages, the way is clear for both killers to escape as well. If we're to believe they took the same way out as they went in and there's no reason to think otherwise, Blood apparently carried a bag with a bleeding head in it back through the throne room and nobody noticed. Again, Laris bragged that the staff of the Red Keep is under his control and they are all conspicuously missing or silent during this 
crucial night at the start of this war. It's a strange coincidence is what I'm saying. Even in Fire and Blood, Blood and Cheese don't have a straight shot to Helena. Instead, they have to kill guards and maids to complete their princely butchery. It's either a crazy coincidence that this part of the castle, which is normally guarded and manned by staff, is empty, or it's something that was intentionally done. And the only character we've been told has that power is Lara Strong. I said at the beginning of the video there were hidden rats in this episode, and I left one for last. A very hidden and odd rat. It was actually revealed in the after the episode that Helena's books, walls, furniture, and basically everything around her has been scribbled and drawn on. Much like her ancestor Danis the Dreamer, whose dreams became the book Signs Importance, Helena has begun recording what she sees. Some of the drawings include wolves without heads, dragons, boars, eyes of different colors, all sorts of oddities. But this one, this one right here caught my eye, the Rat King. A rat wearing a crown and holding a dagger. Certainly one interpretation is that this is meant to represent cheese, that he is being represented as his job as, I guess, the king of the rats because he's a rat catcher, and the dagger the figure is holding is the one used to kill Jaharis. But the crown, that's a little odd. It works in general. However, go with me on this. Maybe Lord Lair Strong is the rat king of Helena's nightmares. In a practical way, while Aegon is officially in control of the Red Keep, the show is telling us, especially in this episode, that Laris is the real king of the Red Keep. He decides who works there, he keeps them under his control and terrified, and he has given himself full reign to kill betrayers and disloyal staff at his whim, with no repercussions and no permissions necessary. In this building that is full of rats, as Damon says it, the literal rodents themselves, and also the numerous staff members spilling everything they see and hear to Laris for fear of his punishment, Lord Strong is undoubtedly the Rat King of the Red Keep. On a more supernatural level, if he is a skin changer using the rats as his spies, as I suspect, it would make sense to see him that way, that he is the King of the Rats, the same as you could consider Bran Stark, King of the Ravens, or King of the Direwolves. Laris would have absolute control over the rats, they would be his subjects alone to command, and their little eyes in every corner grants him the most direct control of the Red Keep itself. Nothing would escape his gaze. And if he is using the rats, this makes the many rats that Blood and Cheese passed far more interesting than just being an animal wrangling budget for HBO Max to burn. Laris could have been watching them the whole way, and perhaps he found out about their scheme to kill Aemon in advance and used his influence to clear the way for the two assassins. Certainly Damon and his crime cloak aren't actually that discreet. We see during his entrance into the city that one of the gold cloaks stops and stares at him even as blood is feigning Damon is just some criminal and he's hustling around. Damon's a character that stands out. Laris being the secret enabler of the attack on Jaharis would make Helena's fear of this Rat King figure justified, and her fear of rats just beginning. While Damon paid for the murder and Blood and Cheese carried it out, this is their one shot. Laris having the power and knowledge to allow assassinations at will and refusing to stop them would make him the real threat to everybody within the Red Keep. Of course, the big question is, why would he let two assassins make their way into the Red Keep and kill the heir to the Iron Throne? And part of this can be explained from the actions we've seen from him in this episode and previous ones. For one thing, we know that he's responsible for the creation of the Green Faction in Season 1, when he encouraged Alicent to make Rhaenyra her enemy by dropping the T on Rhaenyra's moon T, as well as encouraging her and giving her the information to fight back, as well as get Otto back to court. Now, though, he seems to be much more interested in breaking apart the very faction he nurtured. He took out his rival Mysaria and her spy network, which effectively blinded the Greens in Otto Hightower, making Laris their only source of information. In this episode, he was actively encouraging Aegon to get rid of Otto Hightower by playing on Aegon's dislike of his father. He's even trying to split apart another alliance in the Greens with Kristen Cole and Alicent by letting Alicent know that she's been discovered and that their affair is far too dangerous. He's seemingly probing for weaknesses in the green power structure and exploiting them quickly and efficiently. Very odd for a guy who is seemingly loyal to the greens to be actively taking them apart. This could be a power grab for himself, that he's trying to rise even higher within the royal court. He started a rival faction to Rhaenyra, built it up from the shadows, and now wants to make it his. He has certainly come a long way being the second son of Lionel Strong and a lowly confessor to King Viserys. 
Maybe Lara saw an opportunity to use the tragedy of murder within the Red Keep to create a blame game, raise tensions, and let the power players at court take each other out while he waits and then steps into the power voids. Another thing to consider is that the initial target for Blood and Cheese is Aemond, not Jaehaerys. Aemond is seemingly a wild card out of Laris' ability to control and influence. We have seen zero interactions between them, thus there's no hints that Laris even has dirt on the prince. If he's making a power grab for himself, letting an assassination attempt go forward on a new rival at court could hasten his ascent up the ladder and take advantage of the chaos. And he gets to accomplish that by just standing aside while the assassins do their work. A third possibility is that he could be trying to tighten his grip around Allison, the seeming focus of his private desires. In season one, he gave this very odd speech about how children are a weakness and how family and attachments only hold you back. There's a strong argument here that his ideal future is Allison and himself alone at last, with her husband, lovers, family, and friends all removed in one way or another from her life. His rare bloom, as he called her, finally in his sole possession. For Laris, who murdered his own family just to get Allison caught in his web of secrets and his debt, I doubt he would feel even an ounce of remorse at letting any member of her family get killed. I mean, this is the guy that smiled as he offered to carve out the eye of Prince Lucerus for Allison. If Laris thought that letting Jaehaerys, Jahara, or Aemon die in cold-blooded murder would help him in really any way, there's no doubt that he would do it in a second. My last idea for a possible motive is again the world of magic and dream. The way Alaris is taking apart the green faction at court and making it weaker is very reminiscent of how the children of the forest manipulated the first men, using suggestion and subtle pushes in the right moments to cause their stronger enemies to falter. And this might be what Laris is up to. He may have some kind of longer goal in mind that destabilizing the greens now serves. Certainly, we've seen that he's created the seed of conflict that is leading to the dragons going to war by radicalizing Allison against Rhaenyra, and has nurtured those factions into all-out war while confusingly making sure the Greens are starting at a disadvantage. I speculated in the past that Laris could have goals about weakening the Targaryen dynasty in general, and perhaps having the dragons kill each other is some sort of future or long-term plan he's trying to make happen. If he is a green seer with powers similar to Helena, his bizarre behavior and motives may really only make sense once the long-term plan comes into view, not while it's happening. And that brings me to a final point. In a recent interview with the absolutely wonderful History of Westeros podcast, show creator Ryan Condal answered a question about if characters are going to start noticing Helena's prophetic dreams this season. Throughout seasons one and two so far, she's been written off by those around her. Aegon's line about her being an enduring mystery proves that point. So who would be a prime candidate to start noticing that Helena is seeing the future coming? The hyper-observant and intelligent Lara Strong, who loves gathering secrets and notices everything around him and may have a foot in the magical world, seems to me should be near the top of the list, if not at the very top of it. Especially if after Blood and Cheese, Helena starts acting fearful or suspicious of Lara Strong. In a previous video about Helena and her powers, I spoke about how the show is very subtly putting Laris and Helena in proximity to each other, yet not quite having them interact yet. Should Lara Strong start noticing Helena's powers, and if her visions start pointing at him, Laris's attention will very quickly become aroused and a danger to the queen. There is no more dangerous place in Westeros to be than having a secret about Lara Strong. In the coming episodes, we can take some guesses from Fire and Blood. Laris will likely be tasked with finding the killers while the Greens are tearing each other apart trying to find the traitors at court. Keep your eyes open for subtle hints that Laris may know more than was going on or secretly enjoying himself. Everyone will be suspicious and eyeing each other. Take note of how many of them even think to question why the supernaturally reliable spy master missed two dumbasses sneaking their way in and out of the most secure building in Westeros with a head in a sack. And also look out for editing tricks and cinematic language that puts Laris in odd places or positions, or if he suddenly appears answering a question that a character is asking, that kind of thing. And also pay attention if Laris suddenly makes himself the hero by finding blood and cheese with conspicuous ease. Laris could very likely track them down pretty quickly. And this all puts him in prime position to make sure that while everyone is looking left and trying to find the traitors over there, that he might hide the true blame behind him. And that wraps up my first Laris video of the season and going out on a weird limb 
I'm guessing this won't be the last. Even if Laris does not turn out to be a skin changer or a servant of the old god, he has already made a huge impact on the story from the shadows. His growing power, influence, and control of the Red Keep and King's Landing makes him an extremely dangerous character for all involved, as well as a fascinating one to watch. While Westeros has a dragon king on the Iron Throne, there's a rat king watching just out of sight, letting the dragons dance for his amusement. A rat king that may not be done letting accidents happen on his watch. Oh, 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 oh,